Welcome to the Global Medical Device Podcast, where today's brightest minds in the medical device industry go to get their most useful and actionable insider knowledge, direct from some of the world's leading medical device experts and companies. Hello, and welcome to the Global Medical Device Podcast. This is your host and founder of Greenlight Guru, John Spear. And Things are a little bit different today, as we promised you. Joining me as co-host is Etienne Nichols. Etienne is one of our medical device gurus. And Etienne, I guess I should ask you, I know you're kind of taking on a new role. Are you still a guru? Is that still an appropriate title? Yeah, someone actually asked me that yesterday, and they said, you're kind of straddling two fences right now. So it's kind of of (laughs) the situation. Um, But yeah, still medical device guru. All right. Well, welcome back. And I'm looking forward to diving into the conversation. And I'm excited because we have a guest joining us today, Mark Rutkovich. Hopefully I said that okay. I know I, I practiced that a little bit, but Mark is with Innovise and Kinsella. So Mark, welcome to the Global Medical Device Podcast. Thank you, John. Thank you, Adrian. Well, a great place to start before we dive into today's topic is, can you just take maybe a couple moments to give folks a little bit about background about who you are and Innovise and Kinsella? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I said, Mark, Rutkevich. I've been in the medicalized industry about 35 years. I've worked at about six different companies doing everything implantable defibrillators, implantable heart occluders, MRI machines, AEDs, disposable software, hardware, sterile, non-sterile. Been in that industry. Part of it has been mainly designing quality systems. So that's part of been my focus for years, redesigning systems, truly trying to make things integrated. And so that's what Consiliso is. I wrote a couple of books on the topic of how to design integrated business processes for medical device companies to really make it easier. I was an engineer and I hated the way of, you know, finding information and it's like, this can be a better way of doing this. And so over the years, I've developed this methodology and that's what I wrote. So currently I'm also a VP of quality at Innovise. We're a contract manufacturer in the Twin Cities. Uh, most of the medicalized companies, all the big ones, all we're a supplier to. We make all the different kinds of parts, more converting using films and adhesives. Yeah, very cool. And Mark, I remember before I hand it to Etienne to introduce our topic for today, but I remember one of the first times that I met you, I think it was at MDNM West or something like that. It was one of those types of shows. And, you know, you mentioned this Casiliso and, and you were passionate about it. I'm like, all right, so if there's another nerd out there that's as passionate about quality systems as I am, and he's got a book that he's written about it, I'm going to check this out. And I read the book and I was like, I found myself putting little <laughs> highlights and markers all over the damn thing. And I was like, it's a really good book. So you've condensed a somewhat boring and nebulous topic of quality systems into actually, you know, for a medical device nerd, into somewhat of a fascinating read. So thank you for doing that. Thanks. I'm glad you liked it. You know, a guy's serious about his work when he wrote two books on the topic. So I know, right? <laughs> and folks will provide a link to that in the, the notes that accompany the show. You know, it's a relatively quick read. It's not boring. And it's not super expensive either. Yeah. You know, I encourage you to get a copy. I mean, it's it's more of a philosophy type book. Right. That's yeah. the way I interpret it. So yeah, the second book is a textbook. Yeah. 500 pages. That's how to do it. Case, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, Etienne, where are we going to go today? What what are we going to dive into? So when we first talked to Mark, there are lots of different topics we could cover. So one, though, that is a topic, it's always a question mark in a lot of people's mind. That is UDI, Unique Device Identification. So I was curious to know a little bit more about what Mark would have to say on this topic. So Mark, what do you think? Do you have any thoughts on this right now? Yeah, (laughs) UDI. I mean, everybody thinks it's, oh my gosh, there's this new thing going on. And it's like, oh my God, you know, the FDA is requiring it. It's compliance. I got to set these systems. And, you know, going back and peeling back the onion, what what it is, it's like, okay, the grocery stores figured this out in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. And now medical device, we're a lot more complex. It's like, oh my God, this is painful. It's like, it's the same thing as scanning the parts at the grocery store. So about 15 years ago, I sat in on one of these sessions that, you know, the UDI, you know, team that was, you know, developing the standards, you know, this is way before the FDA even required this. And they were talking about the concept of this UDI. And now every part that you use in the hospital room has a barcode on it. And they actually did a study in Japan that mainly were on the drug side, but the device side is sort of the same thing. Like if this patient was prescribed something, then you scan everything that they do. And if somebody made a mistake, they would catch it right away. And what they found is they eliminated tons of mistakes because of that. So the same concept, you know, pharma has been doing it. And then, you know, now in the U.S. for medical advice, we're required to do it. And so the concept is basically you send a unique ID. That ID is stored in a central database in the world so that anybody who wants to know what that, if they scan that, they know what it is. That's the basic concept behind it. 
Now, there's a lot of other things around it. And some of it's, you know, why medical device does it and how it's been implemented is different because we sell products all over the world and different countries have different requirements. And when the U.S. came out with their UDI requirement, they basically defined that you can have three different types of identifiers that are available for you to, as a manufacturer to use. You know, you can use the GS1 codes, which is the worldwide one. You can use the health industry barcode, HIBIC codes, or you can use, there's also the blood bank. And so that was really designed just for the blood banks. So really there's two choices. And the reason there's two of them, HIBIC was original. So HIBIC came in for health code beforehand. And basically what it was, some companies started using it because it allowed you to have any length characters in your barcode. You know, you can have like 30 character barcode and then it was sort of free. So you pay a little bit, but you didn't pay a lot of money for it. But the difference is it, it because it says a long barcode, it also, you have to have a checksum and you do barcodes. And the checksum identifier for HIBIC is really poorly defined because you can use any characters in it. Alpha numeric, you can use dashes, you can use ampersands. I had a problem one time. We had a product using a HIBIC code and the checksum was a space oh, character. Wow. So you couldn't even tell it was there. <laughs> it's like trying to find it. So HIBIC, you know, it was there because of historical reason. That's why they kept it in there. And some companies have to convert over. Europe is requiring that you go to GS1. It's a standardized code for those identifiers. It's a specific length always, and it's all just numbers. Yeah. So it's really straightforward and it's easy to program in computers and stuff like that versus having a variable length field. And so now everybody's starting to do it, requiring it. I think the last ones were, there were some class one exempts that were, they could actually use UPC codes, universal is it's what's in right. the grocery stores and everything. It's sort of some class ones could be UPC instead of having the other codes that we're using them. And then nowadays too, a lot of people are switching to the two-dimensional barcodes, the data matrix, because it takes up less space. Right. So you can do the data matrix one and you can put different information in it. And so if you read through the standards, there's like hundreds of different pieces of information you can encode in a barcode. But just stripping it all back, what's required is you need to have for your product, a number that identifies that product so that when somebody looks it up, they can find it. Now that number, one of the things that when, the talking, when I was in the standards committee, listening to what these guys were saying, Part of it is really need to understand rules of interchangeability. And we'll talk about that at a later time on bombs. But if you want to be able to tell these ones apart, even though it's similar type products, you might want to assign it a different number. And so that's really the key there. And one of the interesting things about the GS1 barcode is it's like 13 character barcode. And when you get one, you need to determine how many codes you want to assign by your company. Yeah. And it's an order of magnitude. You can have 10 codes, 100 codes, 1,000 codes, 10,000 codes. 100,000 codes. And that that's what you pay for what you're going to use. And that's basically what it is. And so trying to manage all those numbers. And so if you're a big company, you're going to have, you know, you want to put this all into your systems that you use for managing your bill of materials and your, you know, how you sell products and stuff like that. You want to manage it that way. And that's sort of my thing on Consilso is integrating it. So don't do this in a tool over here and manage this over here. And then you tell the FDA this over here. And, and then it's like, how do you keep them all aligned? So you want to try and integrate them all together. So don't try and develop a separate system trying to integrate this together. Now, the two aspects of FDA is you need to get a number. So you go to one of these organizations and you get a number. So it then sounds we, like just to interrupt real quick. So yeah. you mentioned GS1 and Hibic. So I would say just to kind of sum that up, you sounds like you strongly recommend GS1 then. Yeah. Well, Europe's going to require it. Right. FDA allowed both, but everybody's using it now. So, I mean, you know, some of the bigger companies, I know some orthopedics and stuff were developing this long time because they have so many different configurations it was easier, but going to that probably going to have to, you know, be probably putting dual codes on it for a while to, to yeah. transition. It's just sort of, it's e it'll be easier and you'll be able to get it all into a data matrix barcode versus having to maintain this the difference between a data matrix and a QR code. Right. What are your thoughts there? I hear people. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you get them intermixed. They're both two dimensional. So it's, you know, it's a little box with a bunch of dots in it. And actually I've seen some horribly printed QR codes, you know, data matrix, and they can read. I mean, your phone can read them. I mean, you know, 15 years ago, it's like, I need a special reader. Well, nowadays anybody's phone can read these things. We all have so the, yeah. yeah, the QR code has basically has three targets in it. So you look at a QR code, you'll see like three little circles with a dot in them. That's a QR code. Data matrix will have two solid lines on two of the edges. So that's a data matrix. That's really how you can tell them apart. And the data matrix, the more information you have, the bigger the data matrix can be. So it's going to have, it'll encode more data. So it'll scale in size. If you have, you know, typically most companies I've seen is you have your identifier, you know, G10, global trade identification number. And then you, you typically add two more pieces of information. One's your lot or serial number. And one's like an expiration date. Yeah. That's sort of the key. Those basic three are really what you need. Mark, so beyond that. Mark, you mentioned that was like when this first kind of became a requirement in our industry a few years back. To your point, nothing with, this isn't new tech. This isn't, you know, it's been in food and 
and other places for a long, long time. But I remember at the time I was working with a med device company you know, as a consultant, trying to help them navigate the whole UDI process. And it was complicated, not because it was hard per se, but it was complicated because the process was poorly defined. Those that listen to the Global Medical Device Podcast know I'm very much a fan of FDA, but this particular rollout, it was not well done. And you know, I, I'm trying to find information because I'm interested in trying to ensure that we're meeting the compliance requirements for UDI. I understand the importance of it, but the information out there was terrible. It was really terrible. I hope things have gotten better. Uh, uh, not really. Your reaction. And that's a no, lot. I mean, because it's really a multifaceted type thing. So you're the company. You have to know your interchangeability of your parts yourself. You have to deal with this third party for assigning a number. And once you get that defined, then you have to tell the FDA. Yeah. So if you sell in the US, then you have to tell the FDA, here's my product. Here's its ID. And then here's 40 other attributes they want on your product. So right. They never asked you those attributes when you make the submission. It's like, it's in my submission. No, they don't ask you, is it sterile in that data field? It's in text. Mm -hmm. So you submit this stuff. So the FDA's you know, submission process should integrate that into your UDI submission, but they built a whole separate database to track UDI information. So now when you do this, you have to answer these 40 questions for your product. And so a lot of companies did. There's a lot of third-party companies got out there. It's like, we'll do it for you because they'll build their own database, right. work with you, assign numbers, and then they'll auto load this into the FDA database. That's what a lot of companies do. It's like, it's just, I'm going to outsource it because I don't want to deal with this. Cause you have to, in order, if you really want to do it white, right? Your internal systems, you need to design your system so that when you create a SKU object that describes what you're going to sell, the GTIN number should be on there. And then these 40 other attributes that the FDA wants should be loaded on that. So you can just extract it. Yeah. And you know, some companies you have to totally redesign your computer systems to do that. So they don't want to do that. So they'll build another tool. Now you got to get interfaces and other things happening. So that's why it became complicated because they want to collect information about the products. Now Europe in the new yeah. EduMed database, they're trying I have no idea where they're at. I really haven't dug into what they're doing, but the concept is everything is in one database. You know, you register your company and your company has IDs, you register your products as part of the submission. And then that UDI information is linked there. And then, you know, every complaint is tied to that product and the company and any recall is tied to the plant. And it's all tied in one gigantic database. Uh <laughs> Philosophically, the benefit of a UDI, I think, is huge. Oh, um, absolutely. And, you know, that connectivity globally, you know, I hope we get there as an industry because, you know, the Udemed, the, you know, the databases that have been long uh, talked about for EUMDR, they sound amazing. I can't wait till that becomes a reality and kind of connect all this data and information because, you know, it can be complicated, I think, as a med device company. I know most med device professionals, they want to do the right thing, but they don't know where to go or what the processes or what this regulatory body requires and how to feed right. information there. The process hasn't been architected or defined well enough to make that process a little bit easier. Right. From the user point of view, it's not architected. Here, and this is what I try and do in Consiloso. So I haven't really laid this one out in Consiloso, but you know, as a user, this is what you have to do as a business process to manage this. And like I said, you know, I said each geography. Now, if, if Europe is doing this, is Japan going to do something similar in the future? Australia is doing more integrated stuff right now with like recall and their registration. So each geography. So as a manufacturer, if you're selling in all these geographies, like how do I design a system that works for all these systems? You're supposed to be universal, right? <laughs> <laughs> and the UDI is that number yeah. in your name, Perfect. but then you have, if you're a multinational, okay, which center designed the product, that's its ID number versus this one manufactures it versus this one sells it. So then as you become multi, if you're a startup company or you're one place, you're one location, you make one product, it's easy. As you start trying to get complicated, you know, part of it's tax advantages and other reasons and or closer to your customers and supply chain. But then that just adds levels of complexity to the UDI. And so who puts on the UDI? Who's the labeler? Yeah. Well, I'm a startup company in the US. I'm only selling the US. It's actually easy. You just do it yourself. Yeah. But, and you only have, you don't have a really complex product, but you start getting into complex products. It's like, yeah, I think one of the questions is, you know, you guys were asking one question earlier before we started this is software. So software is a medical device. Does it have a UDI? It should. Now, as you rev the software, it's versions, should it have a different UDI for every revision? And that's questions of interchangeability and stuff and uh, apply to that. But now you got software going around the world too. And it's, it's different languages and like, you know, just dealing with so complexity. That, that being said, so is that handled practically with the lot, the serial number side of the? Uh, I uh, That place, you know, there's not serial numbers. You know, software is a quantity of one always. So there's not right. really, it's just revision. So you 
you have to assign a new GTIN number every time you can reconfigure it is what the concept would be. Yeah. I really haven't looked into what they've been doing on that for software specifically, but just for typical devices like, you know, wound care dressings and stuff like that. It's pretty straightforward and configuration wise, it's pretty easy. But you start getting devices with software and different electronics and modules and you change the scope. Now, I've had products in the past where, you know, an external defibrillator, one circuit board, you know, but it spoke to you, told you whether or not how to chalk. Well, there was 29 languages and then you put it into a plastic housing and then somebody wanted branded, you know, yeah. so we had like one circuit board, it became a thousand SKUs. <laughs> so what GTIN is it then? Is it a thousand GTINs or is it one GTIN? Cause it's the same circuit board. It's yeah. You have to make decisions. And that's part of this is every company makes decisions differently. So that's why they left the flexibility in it. And uh, so that's why there's really no common process out there because medical devices are not the same as any other industry. So if you're in the automotive industry, what do you make? You make cars. You can have an internal combustion engine. You can have an electric vehicle, but it's still a car. What's a medical device? Yeah, it's so broad. That's one of the things whenever, you know, Greenlight hires a lot of folks like Etienne and myself who have industry experience. But the majority of the people that come to Greenlight, they don't have any medical device experience. So they all go through a new hire orientation. You know, we've got other training and house to teach them. But that's one of the things I have a session with every new hire that comes in. And my first question to them is name some medical devices. And, you know, you get things from defibrillators to knees to hospital beds to tongue depressors. I mean, it's so, so broad and so diverse. So folks, while we're taking a quick break, I want to remind you, we're talking with Mark Ripkovich. Mark is with Innovise and Casiliso. And Mark, while we're taking this break, tell us a little bit more about Innovise. I know you mentioned briefly at the intro that the Innovise does some contract manufacturing. You're in Medical Alley, you know, the where thousands and thousands of medical device companies are. And and also, I guess while we're taking this break, you know, take a moment to talk a little bit about Casiliso and how that might be beneficial to people. Sure. So Innovise, we're a contract manufacturer, been focusing on medical for the last 15 years, got into it as a, we're a converter, which is when I got here, I didn't even know what that was. It's like, so basically it says bandages, they're a medical device. They're really exempt. I mean, but how do you make a bandage? Nobody touches it. It's all made by machines. And it's basically taking films and you run them through a machine and you have like a rotary die cutter. So you can automatically make these things by the millions. So that's what we do. We print laminate, we die cut, we laser cut and can package devices that are more like disposable type things. We do a lot of things with wound care, with diagnostic components, parts that go into pacemakers and defibrillators. We make a lot of parts for that. And we're also getting to wearable sensors now. So sensors, anything that's stick to skin. So right. if you want to stick to skin, you got to, you got to replace it every day. Where do you get that? You know, a lot of manufacturers make adhesive, but not in that shape. And so we buy from the ma adhesive manufacturers and then we cut everything to shape for our customers and then document and maintain traceability and all that stuff because it's a medical device. So we have yeah. You know, intense quality system on that. Consiliso is a sister company to Innovise. So we started that after I wrote my books and just have, you know, I got a separate website for it. It's cross-linked with the Innovise website. But I do consulting on designing quality systems and reintegrating quality systems. And so it's really more for, you know, if you're growing, where's your, all your information, your quality system, and what's the best practice? There's not one software application that can run an entire medical device company. It's impossible. There's too many different requirements and each company's different. So there's quality system side, but then there's the financial side, and then there's, Absolutely. you know, clinical side and regulatory side. And you can merge a lot of it together if you architect it ahead of time. And that's what Consilis is about. Is like, how do you architect everything? Because financial requirements, if you're public or private, can change some of the rules and what you're using on that side. Quality system, you know, are you making a, you know, a disposable? Are you making software? Are you making, do you have to do servicing on this, you know, capital system? And so the requirements for your tools may change and that's how you manage all that. So that's how I do with the Consilis. So. Okay. Well, thanks for sharing that. And I know we're kind of getting toward the tail end of our topic today on UDI. And I want to throw a question out there because I remember, you know, again, going back when this first became, and when you first started hearing from FDA, this is going to be a requirement, you know, in the next year or whatever the time frame it was, the industry was freaking out. And because I think a lot of people heard, oh, I have to put the UDI on my actual product. And I remember a very specific example, like a pedicle screw, like how in the world am I going to put a UDI on a pedicle? medical screw. So right. maybe it's time to dispel or, or bust some myths here. Does UDI actually have to be on the actual product? There are, it needs to be identifiers on the product. What you sell, the sellable object has to have a UDI. What is the intent of UDI? So it's really intended for the hospital user so that they can validate that if I tell this patient supposed to get this, this, and this, you can get that. So if in the operating room, they have a pedicle screw, they could scan it. Well, it's typically in a kit. If you're doing orthopedic with screws and stuff like that, it's in a kit. You can scan the kit and then the kit can be cross-linked with that. 
Now, you may want to look at things up ahead of time. Like when I was doing implantable pacemakers or fibrillators, there was a serial number on the can. We serialized it. But once it was in the patient, could yeah. you see the serial number? No, because it was on the can. But we had x-ray IDs at the time. So if you had an x-ray, you could see what kind of pacemaker it was, which manufacturer. And then you could do the telemetry and talk to it and see what device it is. So it's the intent is trying to be able to find the information about the product. And then some longer term is then the patient. The patient, we try and give, you know, we were implantable device manufacturer, give them an ID card. This is what you have implanted in you. Lot, you know, here's the serial number, here's the model number. So the G10 can be included with that now. Yeah, so basically sense. they know what's inside of them. Yeah, it makes sense. What do you think of it, Etienne? I know you've had to deal with this in some form or fashion in your career too. Yeah, it was interesting when I was working on it. I, you know, was struggling to figure out, you know, how do we do this? Is it brand new? And my wife, who had, you know, I don't know if I can go into personal details. She actually had a pacemaker at the time and got it replaced. It was ten years old and it had the UDI with a 2D barcode. I was like, this is not new, you know, for my career. But I thought that was very interesting. We struggled with how do you validate the direct part marking on the product and things like that. It was an interesting world. So yeah, I love hearing what you have to say about it. Yeah, I mean, the FDA has guidances on direct part marking and what size we got tiny part and you can do some barcodes that are, you know, you don't have to write it all out. You can do some smaller like barcodes that you know, as long as you describe how to use them, if it's really tiny, but you can also do packaging. I mean, a wound care, a bandit isn't directly marked with a UDI. It's on the packaging that you throw away. So the part itself doesn't have a mark on it, but implantables you want to, you know, you want to track and stuff like that. So you can scan things depending on how it's going to be used. How can you scan it so you can make sure that you're using the right product with the right other products and with the right patient? So I mean, that's really the key. One quick thing. So I had interrupted you early on when you were talking about, okay, this is the process. You get this barcode from GS1, you go, you put it on your product. I think I interrupted you at that point. So I just wanted to see if you could sum up that. I know it goes into almost a decision <laughs> tree as you get into contract manufacturing, but any advice that you can give to medical manufacturers in that um, timeline? I mean, what I've been seeing here is, you know, we have lots of different companies that we make products for. And I've seen some other companies that do some contract manufacturing too. And nobody's really standardized. I mean, the FDA, you know, drug side, the FDA says, here's your drug facts. And it has to look like this. So it looks, all the drugs sort of look the same. Medical device, there's no guidance on it. It's like, fit it where you can and use these symbols. And you can use the, at least you can use the ISO standard symbols now. They don't require you to spell them out anymore on the labels like they used to, but so it's just try to design labels. And so I think, you know, if the industry would just come up with, if you're going to just create a label from scratch and use something, start with this. If it doesn't work, that's fine, but at least start with that. That'd be a good thing to work with. And actually I'm, I work with MDIC a lot. I've been involved with the case for quality. That would actually be, this is interesting that if we're talking about this is like, that would be a good project. We're, we're working on a- It would a group called the Safe Space Project. And this would be a good one to also look at standardized labeling. And it's just templates. Like if you're going to start with something, start with this at least versus, you know, people try and come up with designs. I've seen you know, manufacturers, they have no idea even what's supposed to go on the label. You know, they're brand, if they're a startup company, if you're an experienced company, you know exactly what you want. But if you're a startup, you, it's like, what am I supposed to put on here? And whoever you use as your regulatory person for submissions is typically going to bring some kind of template to, to bear for you. So, but yeah, UDI is typically, you know, you try and do, use the symbols for, reference for the model number, lot number, and expiration date, and then just put those exact same fields in there. And most labeling software today integrates that and auto-generates the barcodes within the software. I mean, 20 years ago, no. But today, <laughs> almost every labeling software all does sure. it. So it's not like everybody knew they needed to do it. So, uh, you know, there's a half a dozen labeling softwares that it's, not, it's out of the box this way. So, um, and they're pretty affordable today, too. I remember like 10, 15 years ago, some of the labeling software and the labeling equipment was pretty expensive but it's pretty affordable these days. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot easier. I mean, that's the thing they've, they've designed and integrated it. That really helps. You know, even, you know, five, six years ago, how do I generate a data matrix barcode that wasn't available? Now it is. I mean, yeah. it's all sort of auto-generated. So a lot of places have it. A lot of places have, have the tools. You know, if you're big enough, you can buy your own. If you generate a lot of them. And, you know, one of the projects, when I was at AGA Medical doing implantable heart occluders, we ended up redesigning our whole labeling system because we, we were having errors all the time because we were using the standard methodology where you bought a label that was pre-printed with some information. Then you ran it through a zebra printer and added more information onto it. It was just horrible. So we just totally changed it and designed an integrated system with a labeling software and basically printed the entire, basically bought blank label stock and printed it on a standard copy machine printer. Yeah. It met the requirements for what wow. we needed. So it was, you know, simpler. Uh, it's like, <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> like I, I tell, uh, it's been a while since I told the story, but younger engineers about when I started and it sounds like one of those old man stories, like where oh, I walked uphill both ways to school in the snow barefooted. But there were times early in my career where I was literally cut and paste, like having a piece of paper, cutting something out and taping it. It's like, and they're like, oh man, you're crazy. But yeah, it's real. Well, Mark, I think this is probably a good place to put a pin in on the topic, at least for now on UDI. I, I mean, my take home is, yeah, the process is a little convoluted, a little complicated, but from what a UDI is, is not that deep. It's not that complicated. It's, it has a lot of benefit, but certainly if you need some help and guidance on UDI, there's a lot of resources that are out there. You know, you can reach out to Etienne or Mark or even myself. We've been through there these things a, a time or two. So if we can't help you, we'll point you in the right direction. So let us know. While we're wrapping this episode up, of course, I want to thank our guest, Mark Rikovich with Innovise and Casiloso, and of course, co-host Etienne Nichols at Greenlight Guru. And I want to remind you too that Greenlight Guru, we're here to help. We have the only medical device success platform on the market today. Well, what is a success platform? Well, it's designed specifically for the medical device industry by actual medical device professionals, and it includes workflows to help you manage your design and development your risk management activities, helps you manage documents and records, including electronic routing and review and approval and revision control. We have workflows that help you manage all of your quality events, post-market, things like complaints and customer feedback and CAPAs and things of that nature. And it's all tied together. Mark's right. You're not going to find one software solution that does everything that your medical device company needs. But when it comes to managing all of your quality related information, Greenlight is a source of truth, a single source of truth for that information. It's all tied together. So I encourage you to check it out. Go to www.greenlight.guru and learn more about our software. And if you'd like to talk to someone from our team to share what your needs and requirements are and see if we have products and, and services that can help you, we'd love to have that conversation. So check it out. As always, thank you for listening to the Global Medical Device Podcast. It's the number one podcast in the medical device industry. And that's because you're listening to it and because you continue to share the Global Medical Device Podcast with your friends and colleagues. So thank you for doing so. Until next time, this is your host and founder at Greenlight Guru, John Spear, and you have been listening to the Global Medical Device Podcast.